Hello, viewers. Welcome back to another segment of It's a Learning Curve. Today is the follow-up segment of our previous segment in which Mr. John Curry helped us with a lot of tips and guidance on mergers and acquisitions of a small business or a big business. He introduced us to a lot of aspects and concepts involved in mergers and acquisitions. However, it was necessary for all of us to learn the financial angle of M&A. And that's why today, Mr. John Curry is going to put light on this segment of mergers and acquisitions. So John, welcome back. And without taking a lot of your time, I would like to go ahead and request you to shoot your presentation. Sure, sure, Trippy. Good to see you again, and thanks for inviting me back. Uh, last time, how about if I share my screen um, so everyone can see my screen? Yes. Great. And I will put on the... So la last time, we talked about uh, mergers and acquisitions from a strategic aspect. The, the point of view of uh, a strategic aspect. How do you find that part, the ideal partner? And what do you look for? And how do you, uh, from the point of view of the entrepreneur, that's, that's the point of view I like to, to talk from. Um, we're talking to entrepreneurs and you say, who is a good uh, merger or acquisition partner for my company? Yeah. And it's, it's about thinking through their, uh, what, what are their holes? But what we did not talk about, and which is very important, is the financial aspects. <clears throat> what, what's the, the financial transaction? And I don't want to get down into the weeds, but there's some very important principles around selling your company. And, um, and so I just thought I'd walk, walk folks through with uh, some simple analogies and how to approach this issue. Um, and and a, a common word is exit. A lot of entrepreneurs want to exit uh, and, and sell their company at a very high number. So let's just talk about what, uh, what that looks like. So the, the first point of view is what's the driver for selling your company? You may wake up one day and say, I want to sell my company. It's time to sell. Or a company may come into you, a different uh, buyer may come in and say, hey, I want to buy your company. Um, so that could uh, easily happen. In either case, though, you have to do the same work to prepare to sell your company in an M&A. So we'll talk about what that is. The analogy uh, that I hope to spend the time today, think about it as selling your house. It's the very similar process as selling your house, the kind of work you have to do to put your house on the market. Um, and so what do you do typically? You know, you bring in realtors, you have to stage your house, uh, you know, you go through a lot of work to get the maximum price for your house. It's the same with your company. So one of the things you have to think about, what stays with the house? And this is where last time Tripti asked a question about employees. You know, you, ha you may have a lot of employees. Well, that's one of the things that you can dictate terms, that this is certain employees, uh, how they're treated, how long they uh, will remain on the books. You, you're giving up control, but you can dictate terms with what stays with the house. You may have a lot of capital equipment. You may have some intellectual property. What goes with the house? What stays with the house? You get to dictate all of that in um, in, if you sell the company. Uh, cash versus equity. So this is always important, right? How much does the buyer of your house, how much is they bringing in cash versus borrowing? If they come with 80% borrowed, that's sort of a weak offer. And, and that a lot of buyers of companies may come with an all equity you know, their larger companies have equity and that equity is worth something as opposed to cash. So cash is strong, equity is not as strong. 
And probably the most emotional thing about selling your house is setting the price. It's, uh, you know, where buyers and sellers could be way off. So we'll spend some time talking about how do you uh, set the price and what is a fair price? And we'll spend some time talking about that. <clears throat> and that's what they call the due diligence process. Mm -hmm. um, and just like selling your house, you bring in lots of realtors and you have to pick a realtor and they give you estimates and they you use them for their knowledge. And just like selling a house, probably the largest um, guide or contribution to setting the price is what's called a comp, a comparable. Yeah. You always look at your comps. And in companies, it's very similar to houses. Who, who's in your neighborhood? Uh, what is your peer group? You, if, if Tripti and I are in a specialty chemical company. And if we wanted to sell our company, we would not look at, uh, you know, ice cream stores or um, shoe stores. You know, we'd have to find companies in our peer group. Um, so there's a, a lot, you bring in industry um, analysts who know these things and they give you information. And that leads to that second tip, the rule, what are the rules of thumb? And they basically boil down to two, uh, two financial terms. One rule of thumb is, a, and they're both a multiples, what's a multiple on your gross sales? Do, is the sale price one time, two times, three times, four times your gross sales? Or is a multiple of your profits? Mm. And that's also, uh, I can give you an example. Here's, um, if you see, this is Scott Macon is one of these industry analysts who specializes in setting companies' values if they want to sell. And what this report talks about is, uh, if you can read the small print there, this, in specialty chemical transactions, the first half of 2020, companies sold for 10.6 times the profit, as opposed to the year before, they were 9.5. So it was roughly 10 times the amount, and it increased from nine to 10 times the profit. So that's the industry standard multiple for specialty chemical companies. Further down in the report, and I'm sure uh, commodity chemical companies don't sell for that kind of uh, margin. And if you look at things like software companies, you have much higher uh, margins on multiples. It also says in this report, uh, gross sales, that it looks like the, uh, the sales multiple is three times, 2.4, 2.3, and 2.1. So one and a half, two, two, two and a half is the multiple of gross sales, you know, something that's much lower. And that's uh, two good rules of thumb that people will tell you for your industry how to set the price, what's reasonable and fair. Um, and things like PE ratios, PE means price to earnings ratio. It's the price of your stock uh, divided by your earnings. And those ratios are very important on an industry basis which give you um, a lot of industry analysts rank you according to your peers of your PE ratios. And what's factored into the price per earnings ratio is the growth sector. The industry growth is factored into there. So that's why you see ratios that are all over the map. And I can show you another example of a report where is that? Right here. So this PE ratio by sector, this is a good um, page that says, okay, from all of the hundred, let's say 200 industries, there's a number of firms, the current PE ratios range, and you can see their range from as high as cable TV is 156 to coal and related energy is seven. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you can see that price uh, to earnings ratios are all over the map. And that has to do with the growth rates, uh, the, the profit, 
and the, the earnings of these companies. Great. So I guess with that, I'm going to turn it back to Tripti. I'll stop sharing. And uh, Tripti, why don't you uh, feel free to ask, ask some questions? Absolutely. Let's see, where do I? Uh, on the top. Sorry, sorry yeah. about my, uh, there it is, stop share. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much for pinpointing so many points quickly uh, regarding the financial aspect of mergers and acquisitions. I just have one question. So there are companies who have been there for a long time, like say five or six years, have potential in their uh, technology, but haven't made any revenue. So haven't made any profit. Can they still be eligible to exit? Can they really make money out of selling their company? Or is it a good idea? Like in the first place, is it a good idea to sell our company? That's, that's a great question. And, and I, you know, I will say that's why early stage tech, where the revenues and the profits are, uh, you know, very immature, perhaps non-existent, it's very difficult. It's, it's very difficult to set prices because uh, usually the financial rules of thumb are very well known. And when you're dealing with larger companies, you can quickly dig into the financials and quickly come to a price range to reach agreement or not. With tech early stage tech companies, it is very difficult. I will say that. Be now, um, you, you know, one thing I did say setting price, it really does come down to, well, it's, it does come down to what will someone pay? <laughs> and that is, you know, what someone will pay and in large, and this is where what people, those industry PE ratios are what people commonly pay. So it's fairly easy to set, wake up one day and say, Hey, I, I'm putting my house on the market and I'm putting a fair price. And people can look at it and say, Ooh, I want that house. That's a good deal. If you are an early stage tech and you don't have those, it's, it's more difficult. It is more difficult to sell. And you think you, you value things like, well, take a look at the intellectual property we have, take a look at the capital assets. You look at some other things, but the fundamental numbers usually dictate the M and a transactions. Thank you. That makes sense. Mm. Yes, absolutely. And what is the smart way to identify negotiation points in which we can get a lot of money by selling a company? Uh, so the, the strongest way is with good numbers, right? If you, so if you look at those two rules of thumb, um, like a lot of consulting firms can't, can't be sold very easily, even yeah. though they're grossing a lot of sales, yeah. it's just all people. And uh -huh. the, the, the rule of thumb with a consulting firm is one times, you know, your value is one times revenue. Right. Because the people will walk out the door and there's no right. intellectual property. Yeah. And so usually consulting firms are not very highly valued where product companies and intellectual property companies uh, are and software companies that don't have a that have a lot of profit. Mm -hmm. You know, figuring out how to get a lot of profit yeah. on your in in your operation is the way to get the highest price yeah. for your company. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, and one last question is, if a company has multiple IP, like multiple patents, while selling the company. Can we still hold on to some IP and just sell out some IP? Uh, that's a good question. Um, the, the, the short answer is yes. Oh. You, just like selling the house, you, you could say um, everything's going. You know, you take all the IP okay. and everything you can do with it. The other thing you could do is say, I'm taking this room, like the furniture in this room, which okay. is I'm taking the intellectual property for this field of use. Okay. And that can be put in the agreement that I'm, and, and it could either be structured as 
you take over the IP, but I'm getting a license agreement, exclusive yeah, license okay. agreement forever, yeah. or I'm taking the intellectual property and I'm granting you exclusive license agreement. You know, I'm keeping all the intellectual property and I'm granting you an exclusive one for forever. Perfect. I got it now. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you can do those terms, you know, they, they can be done. Okay. Um, yeah. It's, it's important to know the value. What is it that the buyer really wants and what they're paying for? Are they, right. are they paying for people? Are they paying for customers? Are they paying for that operation, the high profit? Are they paying for the intellectual property? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that was a fantastic session. Uh, I got to learn a lot. And thank you very much for answering my questions. With that, I would like to thank you, John, for taking time and doing this with us today. And I would like to thank the viewers who have given an overwhelming response to John's videos. Oh. People are liking John. They are sending wishes to you. And uh, we would like to see you again on the show sometime soon. And thank you very much for this support. Keep watching the show for such uh, educational and informational videos. Thank you very much and have a good day. Great. Thanks, Tripti. We'll talk to you.